So John, we, John Fleming here, the former uh, chief planner, planning officer for the city of London and a chief planning officer when it came to building a greenhouse at the food bank. Um, <laughs> last time we had such a good time and I heard from a lot of folks who saw our last um, installment who, who were really thankful that you were able to, you know, not just go off into retirement and ride into the sunset but that you'd actually come forward and help this poor old guy from the food bank to try to get a greenhouse started, which is great. But I did want to talk to you in this round, John, and um, thank you for doing this as well. I want to talk to you about this round, just about urban agriculture and where it's going. This has nothing to do with the food bank. It has everything to do with London and its future. But I noticed there that you were wearing your Western uh, t-shirt. Yeah. And, yeah, I know. Good for you. And uh, I think I know that you're teaching up there. What is it that you're doing up there? Well, Glenn, um, I'm working with a couple of different centers up there. One is the Human Environments Analysis Lab. That's led by uh, Dr. Jason Gilliland. Yeah. Um, and that very much deals with all kinds of urban issues um, and a really bright uh, group of young people that are uh, learning about urban issues, but digging in. So these are PhD mm -hmm. candidates. These are master's candidates. Um, and a, a whole supporting group of students behind that. Um, also, also working with the Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance um, with uh, Martin Horak, who I believe you know, and um, yeah. and Jason. I know them both. They're both great. Yeah, they're fantastic, both of them. And um, also Michael Bazelli's there is the the new chair. Godwin Arku. So it's a, a great team. That's at the Center for Policy Local Governance. And they're very much are looking at, um, well, as the name says, local governance issues as they relate to the development of our urban areas. Um, so it's it's really interesting stuff, lots of overlap with what I uh, did in practice for over 30 years. Um, but I'm also teaching. So mm. in a very tangible way, I'm teaching what do you think urban uh, planning and development and yeah. um, I, i'm doing these little projects throughout the city with these students where we're trying to help mm. real live real world clients folks in the downtown all these village active transportation groups and doing all these little projects throughout the city that are, are pretty interesting um but the students are doing the research, lots of primary research and digging in and coming up with uh, results and recommendations. So it's this nice connection between city and university. And uh, yeah, so it's a lot of fun, loving it. And you're building the future with these students. So that's great. So listen, this show is called Food Bites. So you and I have to concentrate on food here. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so I'd like to do that. And, and I find it interesting that someone like you, you know, you're so aware, not just of the London scene, but of the broader perspective, probably around the world, but especially in Canada. And I know that you put um, things like urban agriculture within the framework of the London plan, which is what we had talked about last right. time. But I do remember you saying, or writing that uh, you had had a party at your house in which you hosted a number of people. And then all of a sudden the idea of urban agriculture landed with you in a way that it hadn't before. Could you explain that a bit? You bet. I'd, I'd say there are two epiphanies and I'll start with the first one that you mentioned, which is the, the party. And uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a fun little gathering prior to Christmas and um, everybody was asked to bring a little bit, it was a bit like a potluck um, dinner, but um, what I did was I put sort of a ledger size piece of blank white paper, just taped it to the wall, and um, we all, after we had done little pieces of the meal, we all kind of mapped where the food came from that mm -hmm. we're eating, and of course there was like coffee and there was wine. But there was also produce, all kinds of things that had the labels on the packaging. And I started to realize, you know, we had, I had drawn out a very crude kind of continental kind of map showing the different places in the world that people could map their um, food location on. And Glenn, wow, you couldn't believe how far ranging the location of these um, food sources um, were. And I started to think about what is the greenhouse gas implication of bringing that food from so far away. And don't forget, here we are in, you know, the breadbasket of Ontario. We're in southwestern Ontario, which is unbelievable. 
um, food country in terms of growing food. So yes, it's it's understood there are different foods that you can't grow here, and that's naturally going to happen that you're going to have to import them. But there are many on our plate um, that it occurred to me we were bringing them in from far away that really um, we didn't need to. And the second time um, that it really hit me, um, and this would probably resonate with others, is when COVID hit. And the first time I went into the very reliable supermarket I've been going to since you know I was a kid. At first with my mother, of course, and then father, and then um, you know since I was an adult, and seeing these these empty shelves, it was shocking. You know what we thought was absolute unshakable bedrock by way of a food system that was going to feed us always we could count on it all of a sudden is shaken and and those two things i think um have come together in my mind to really underscore the importance of, of urban agriculture so um you know i look at our our current system and i start to think of yeah maybe covid has sort of um you know, got to a point where we're all getting on with our lives and not so much affected by it. But um, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. And um, don't think that our agricultural lands around us are um, in some way exempt from the impacts of, of climate change. Now, we've seen even prior to the extremes of weather conditions um, that are starting to become more and more regular, we've seen all kinds of droughts in our region. And imagine if we have a real significant drought at some point and what that could do to our food security or our ability to grow food even in our region. Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen if climate change becomes so aggressive and so much of an issue that 10, 15, 20 years from now, um, carbon emissions are just not acceptable worldwide? and significant financial taxes and other kind of regulations come into effect potentially that mean that uh importing the food the way that we have become accustomed to just becomes impossible and so you know these are just some potential futures that urban agriculture helps us uh, to become more resilient against it's such a huge um uh, subject but something that i think is is growing now i want to be clear here glenn that uh we're not intending in any way to say urban agriculture replaces traditional agriculture in our region you know that's as i said before we are in a an incredibly productive agricultural hinterland and nobody's pretending that urban agriculture is anyway going to supplant that or should supplant that in fact, it should connect and it should augment and it should work together with our regional uh, agricultural system. But urban agriculture, I think, is going to be a really important factor going forward and one that's going to help us to deal with these um, really uncertain food security issues that we all face. Yeah. The um... <clears throat> It's such an interesting time because it is very complex. For instance, 90% of the food that's grown in Ontario goes overseas. And as someone who's worked in Africa and in Sudan, uh, de definitely through the World Food Program, a lot of the food that kept my kids alive, I have three kids from South Sudan, that kept them alive during the time of the Civil War there was grain and other crops that were grown in Canada. Yeah. Right. sent through the UN and through the, the World Fruit Program and dropped onto these villages where my kids were living. We didn't even know them then. But the point was it kept them alive along with other people. And then so the whole global link, I think, is still very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of our farmers in Ontario excel at that global link and being able to do all sorts of things that are uh, really interesting. So in that sense, it's good for the economy. On the other sense, we've got farmers here that have been in this region for perhaps a century, maybe even longer through their family uh, tree, and uh, but now they're going out of business. So, mm -hmm. so we have this thing in which the local farming situation is much more vulnerable than the global situation. 
And yet as a result of COVID, we also saw how vulnerable the global situation was. Supply lines, ports that were closed, airports that were closed, all the pesticides and all those things that come into food from overseas. So I think it's pretty complex. I don't think it's easy, but I think I do see something of a future, John. Uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Third Place, but it was about this idea of growing inside abandoned buildings. Right. Like California is doing that like crazy. Other places are as well. So rather than retrofitting them for occupancy or industry or whatever they were going to do, they were set up as vertical gardens and they began to use computers, modern technology, other things, great amount of information. And they've begun to grow inside mm -hmm. uh, these buildings in ways in which it, they're growing crops that could not normally be grown in that region. Crops from around the world because they've been able to condition mm -hmm the circumstances to grow those things. Do you see, it seems to me that in urban agriculture, as we work out this larger global piece and as we try to figure out the local, do you see a sense in which the farmers, even in the region, could begin to help us to develop these interior farms, these vertical farms in large buildings, huge buildings that need to be retrofitted if people are gonna live in them or whatever, but could more easily be redesigned in ways to help. Do, do you see that the farmers who are running in trouble in the land and, and, and having trouble making it work could, in, in a sense, really help people with urban agriculture to grow this stuff? What's your view? Well, there's a, a lot of elements to your question. Um, and the first one, I think, is about growing food more locally. And, and that's both on land and in sort of the traditional agricultural ways, but in new ways. So yeah, you mentioned um, vacant buildings. I know, for example, um, a group that I'm working with at Kellogg's right now are actually doing urban agriculture within their building. Walked by the other day with some students on a bit of a tour and mm -hmm. looked down in there and there's stacks and stacks of, of um, vegetables being grown in the former Kellogg's factory. Mm -hmm. You know, very high ceilings, really amenable to that kind of use. Um, and, and you know, the, the changes that were recently made by the city allow for that kind of growing of food uh, within a variety of different locations by way of planning permission, zoning uh, regulations. So they've opened the door, thankfully and, and gratefully, um, they've opened the door to this kind of, of growing in urban conditions. Can the agricultural community that's been more traditional help? Absolutely. And we, we've seen that, Glenn, I think, at the food bank. Um, when we wanted to do a greenhouse, it became very clear, you know, we're urban um, folks that are pretty simple when it comes to uh, our notions of growing food. And then Luis Reyes came along and, um, wow, what a, what a difference since uh, he came on board with all of his knowledge on how to grow food. And so those folks that are in that sort of regional, more traditional uh, agricultural field definitely have this unbelievable um, knowledge that can help us on the urban ag front. Like I said at the beginning, um, I don't think that urban agriculture is in any way going to supplant the more traditional agricultural in our area. I think it's working together Mm -hmm. um, between those systems and actually more of a unified uh, food system between urban and um, more rural environments. But certainly that's an invaluable resource there. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I'd say is that, you know, this idea of growing more food locally, I think is key. And, and there's something that um, is emerging called a locavore. Have you heard of that one yet, Glenn? I have. You could explain it. Yeah, well, essentially, it goes back to the party story that I, I told us. Mm -hmm. The idea is to do whatever you can to to eat food that is grown more locally. Mm -hmm. You probably heard of the 100-mile diet or 100-kilometer diet, Canadian or European terms. But uh, the idea is to try and um, tread more lightly on our planet in the way that we're consuming our food. And so that's only you can only do that so much if food isn't being grown locally. So there's the other side of that. There's the consumer side that's looking to do that. But then there's the production side. And um, did you know also that uh, I, I saw something recently that 50% um, of the vitamin C from many leafy greens 
leaves the plant and the value of, of that plant from a nutrition point of view after the first week of its existence. Mm -hmm. So imagine these leafy greens that are coming our way from California and, and Mexico and South America. Um, you know, what, how long, do, what's the journey look like? How long until uh, it gets here? What kind of pesticides, chemicals, et cetera, were used when it was grown? What kind of preservatives have been included um, in order to make it last that journey? This is all stuff that becomes much more controlled when foods uh, grown yeah. locally. And the last thing I'll touch on that, that stems from your question is about the technology that's emerging. So growing food indoors, um, LED lighting um, has really made a huge impact in the ability to essentially do what the sun does and uh, provide what's required by plants um, in order to, to grow new, nutritious um, crops. Uh, but it's interesting that, for example, as opposed to halogen light or other traditional lights, LEDs um, can get very close to the plant without scorching them because they don't produce a lot of heat. Uh, LEDs can be connected easily to uh, computer systems so that the wavelengths of the LED um, light emissions can actually be altered to benefit different types of crops. Yeah. So the way that different plants work is they're looking for um, light on a certain wavelength. So it can become very scientific um, in terms of the technologies that are being used now in terms of climate control, in terms of uh, reusing water, introducing the right kinds of nutrients into um, the hydroponic system. It's, it's amazing what can be done, but all with the idea of growing more food uh, locally and taking advantage of um, urban agriculture to augment what we're already growing locally. Yeah. You know, to a small degree, a micro degree, we see Louis doing that at the greenhouse. He runs the whole thing for this smartphone, right? He's got these LED lights that you were talking about, which don't take much power at all. Um, but, you know, he can create situations in which the lights trick the plants to think that, oh, I still got five hours of sunlight left or whatever it is. So they continue to produce. And he's been able to rapidly advance harvest and other things because of it. But that's through technology and that's through the kind of lights that you're talking about. So obviously, even at that level, it's possible. But can we talk about the, the larger level? I mean, I think Canadian cities have real advantages and disadvantages, right? We're so far spread out. Mm -hmm. one another that that's difficult 80 percent of our population lives with just a few within a few miles of the you know the 49th parallel with, with with the state so we're all pretty crammed down here along the border and yet we got such fantastic land expansive land and with a small population so there, there's there's huge potential there and i see cities doing different things john and and if you could highlight some of those if you know them that would be great mm -hmm. But I, through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, or even through uh, the, the Ontario uh, municipalities, do you see them coming together and saying, let's collaborate on these ideas of local farming, of urban farming, of technology, you know, even of, as working as regions like here in London with Chatham and the others? Do you see that beginning to happen now, or is that yet to stake its claim? Yeah, I, my feeling is it's... Um... We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that the whole field of urban agriculture, and we saw this when we were trying to develop our greenhouse, and then since then helping others to develop their greenhouse, um, it's very siloed, both between municipalities and in terms of even the agricultural products that are available. It's not easy. And so, you know, what we talked about uh, changing the city's regulations and policies to make urban agriculture easy what you're describing would make urban agriculture a lot easier as well. And that is some sort of nationwide, province-wide support mechanism to help municipalities, to help individuals um, who want to participate in urban agriculture, to um, wade through some of the regulatory issues, to purchase the, the right equipment. Because in, in an urban setting, the equipment is often much different than what is required in a rural setting. So, yeah, I think if there's a, you put your finger on, Glenn, a missing piece, um, 
sure there's lots to at a regional and provincial sorry a regional provincial and federal level to support more rural agricultural initiatives but not a lot i don't think that's really intentionally supporting um, urban agriculture and i stand to be corrected perhaps i just don't know but the fact that i've been working with you on this and haven't bumped across that yet i think says something it seems to me it's overlaid by our our working of federalism. Federalism, of course, is what started, uh, you know, with confederation uh, a long time ago. But back then, the idea was was really that you have these three jurisdictions, federal, provincial jurisdiction, but the baby of them all, the runt of the litter, was always um, local stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you have a political system that really, and I saw this when I was in Ottawa, it could really... Uh, have hearings, bring people in and talk all about how to send food overseas or to help the large farmers, even technology for them, giving them tax breaks and other things if they would work towards doing things that would lower their carbon footprint. We did all that, but locally, where so much of the innovation can happen and where the consumers really live, right? Uh, there's not a lot there. Now, I realize that that's changing a bit, from the provincial and federal levels. But it still seems to me that part of what we lack at the local level is actually political clout. So if I'm a municipality, I can't raise taxes. I can only raise property taxes. I can't go into debt, mm -hmm. right? So if mm -hmm. I see a big thing, a big opportunity for, for this, for urban agriculture in my own community, I can't go into debt in order to acquire it. I have to somehow either attract businesses to my region that have that capacity or convince the larger jurisdictions, the province and the feds to put funding into this or change policy so that I, as a local um, government, can start to do it. And it does seem to me that a big part of the problem, as like with homelessness, is that local jurisdictions actually don't have the tools necessary to fix it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true around the urban agriculture thing for cities? I, I certainly think there's a, a lot of truth in what you said. Um, I think that the provincial, federal, and even municipal level tends to focus on the big pieces. Yeah. So it's like the big farms or the big food processing plants. Um, you know, I, I point to um, London Economic Development Corporation, who I think are doing a really great job. Yeah. Kapila Kosha is there. Um, great leadership and very much focused on the food sector, understanding where we are in this agricultural um, hinterland here, uh, a really special place to do that kind of food processing. You can see Maple Leaf just recently came here. And it's really important that somebody has an eye on that big picture. <clears throat> what I don't think um, the feds and the province are really focused on is how can we address our food security issues in part through more grassroots initiatives, urban agriculture being a really important one? How can we grow food more locally? And it's tough for them because what it really means is supporting um, more grassroots initiatives as opposed to a big project, which is much easier for them to kind of think about track what the the jobs are associated with you know it's it's just more tangible and easier to to focus on i think for senior uh, levels of government but what i'm really interested in glenn is this idea of growing food locally and making it part of our neighborhoods yeah and so um you know again it's a grassroots pardon the pun um grassroots type of approach to food security and again, it's not intended to be the only way that food security is achieved, but an important part of a system. So let me explain what I mean by that in terms of neighborhood uh, urban agriculture. Um, you mentioned indoor growing, and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, there's an opportunity to grow um, food in pods of um, what people might think of as shipping containers, that have been modified or small buildings of about that si size and clustering these together on something as small as a single detached residential building lot or two maybe you can get three four or five of these together in a cluster and actually produce a lot of food and i've seen some models where we're talking about over a million pounds of food 
produced by this kind of use. And um, again, they would use that high uh, tech kind of approach where they would have, um, first of all, it'd be vertical farming within these units. Uh, they'd be using uh, LED lighting and, and other technologies to stimulate growth. They're, it's all hydroponic. Um, you'd be recycling water. Uh, you'd significantly reduce, um, I've heard to the tune of, um, what was it now? I, I'm thinking it's uh, eight, 800, um, believe it or not, 800 kilograms of um, greenhouse gases that one of these pods can um, eliminate in terms of the same food production per year. I mean, that's huge. That's one pod that could be in one neighborhood. And what that can do, Glenn, is, um, as you pointed out to me, much of our food that's grown in our rural area, our agricultural area, uh, is shipped out to Toronto, down the highway a couple hundred kilometers. And then our institutions like Western or Loblaws, you know, some of our, our businesses, um, other institutions might be the hospitals, um, education, board of education, et cetera. These are big food users. And um, then you, you take uh, some of the private businesses, including things like hotels or supermarkets. They're going down oftentimes to uh, Toronto to buy their food. To the food terminal. And yeah, the food terminal and the very food that was grown, you know, next door to us in our rural area is making its way down the highway, producing all that greenhouse gas. A limiting, you know, we talked about the vitamin C, but the nutritious value is diminishing as these things are transported away from us down the 401 and then they're brought back. Yeah. So growing food locally eliminates all of that. And then there's this really special opportunity to make it the hub of na a neighborhood. And so, you know, you, you can grow your food in these kinds of indoor facilities, these, these clusters that I'm referring to, but you can include markets around them. You could include yeah. um little opportunities for food education you can have food processing so you can have local neighborhood relishes and jams and uh salsas and those kinds of things you could have um cooking classes you can have uh plant swaps you know it all becomes part of the fabric of a food neighborhood yeah and in the meantime there's a lot of food that's grown there that can also go to neighborhood resource centers to feed those um, yeah. that are hungry. Yeah. Well, John, we're out of time. Uh, no. Yeah, I know. So I think we do need to have a third one of these maybe in a uh -huh. month or two. Can I give you a bit of homework? Would you mind checking out other jurisdictions, maybe even in Canada, mm. that are taking some of these things and actually doing something about it? Because we often learn from other jurisdictions and what they are doing. And uh, I would be interested in some of those examples and also how they have teased the larger jurisdictions or the corporate sector into cooperating with them to help them to fund some of those innovations and to make them work. If you wouldn't mind doing that, that, that would be a help. But I really think the London plan and what you put together with your team those few years ago still stands there. It still stands the test of time, but it needs to be populated. It needs to be funded. It needs to be policied all of those kind of things, but at least you put it out there so we can move in that direction. And I think that's great, but you don't mind doing that homework for us, do you, John? Sure, I'm happy to do that. And I will say that my sense is London is a bit of a leader. Yeah. Um, as a municipality, as a, as a city, we often are, but it's people like you that is just sort of grabbing the bull by the horns and going with it. And it's not just, you know, all about government yeah. uh, taking that on. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to, take a look at it, see what's happening in other cities and compare it. That's so, right. What we're doing Maybe uh, sometime in November, we'll do another one of these, John, and, and uh, go over what you found. That would be great. Thanks for all you've done for the city. The stuff that you planted all those years ago when you were at the city is now beginning to come to fruition. And I thank you for all that work. Oh, well, thank you, Glenn. Appreciate all that. Right. Nice to chat you. with you as always. All right. Good. Talk to you later.